This is Ed Rep Radio, presented by Eastman Music Company. This is Ed Rep Radio, a podcast to bring you ideas and information from industry experts you can use on the road every day. Presented by Eastman Music Company, and I'm your host, Shane Duell. We have all seen the effects of the pandemic on every aspect of our society over the last couple of years, especially in education especially in music education. The world of music education has been shaken to its core, with many programs and teachers suffering the effects of school not being in person and not being able to predict the future in any way on how their programs are going to look. I'm sure you as an ed rep have had extraordinary challenges as well, trying to service your schools and teachers as best you can. Now that it seems COVID is finally declining, mask mandates around the country are going away, and perhaps the world of music education is starting to emerge from two years of this pandemic, I wanted to check in with someone who has been in the trenches with teachers, trying to be a voice of encouragement and optimism to music educators. We are going to be talking with Scott Lang, who started the well-known recruiting website, Be Part of the Music, Scott Lang Leadership Camps, and is a frequent speaker at MEA shows. Scott will also be presenting at NASMD in Tucson in a couple weeks. Scott's a former music educator and deeply understands the challenges that teachers are facing, what music education is going through at this very moment, and how important your role as an ed rep is going to be to help teachers move forward into not just a new normal, but a better normal than they knew even before the pandemic. Scott is a great motivational speaker, and I hope you find some encouragement from what he has to say today. I also suggest you check out his websites, and I'm going to be putting the links to his websites in the program notes of this episode. Scott Lang, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. So let's get into first about who you are and and kind of your background as a music educator and your world in music. So where did you start in music? Well, you know, I mean, like everyone else, I started in a high school band and, and uh, you know, saw a light at the end of the tunnel and thought, this is what I want to do with my life. And, you know, my career as an NBA center didn't seem to come to fruition. <laughs> Being five foot six and cat juggling didn't seem to be something that would put food on the table. So I decided to give the music education route a try and uh, spent 16 years inside a classroom. One is an administrator, which is inside padded walls. And then uh, 17 years ago, breached, uh, branched out into the leadership world, which kind of led me to where I am today, which is talking to you from my, my bedroom uh, with my uh, quirky but lovable golden receive- retriever who needs uh, CBD more than any animal ever created. <laughs> And what state is it that you're, I'm in, you're Arizona, in right now? Arizona. Which is okay. A fantastic place to live nine months of the year and as a variation on living on the face of the sun for three months a year. Right, right. But for most of the year, I'm looking at snow outside my window. I bet you're not. No, not unless I pull up a screensaver, which I'm not averse to doing if it'll put us in the mood, but I'm looking <laughs> at green grass and 78 degrees. All oh, right. Nice. Can you really look at a temperature? I mean, not really. I, I, I suppose. I suppose that was the wrong phraseology. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> All good. So you were in the the band room, right? You were your band teacher. I was. I was a band room. All right. And what grades did you teach? I taught high school. I've I've spent my entire life uh, dealing with high school, and you know, you think okay. that's going to prepare you for having a high school age son, but it turns out that's not the case, actually. <laughs> Good to know. Um, it's actually maybe <laughs> ill prepared me to deal with my son. So, so I got that going for me. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned you're, you're now in the leader role and, and that's what your business is. Can you tell us a bit about your, your business and how it started and uh, kind of some of the offerings you do today? You know, here, here's what you, I have to understand about music education. It's the most lateral profession on the face of the planet. I mean, think huh. about this for a second. 
If you're if you start out at 22 years old, an assistant bank uh, branch teller, and you're really good at your job, you get moved up to head branch. You get moved to teller, and then after you're really good at your job, you move to head teller, and then if you're really good at your job, you go to vice president of that branch, and then if you're really good at your job, you become the, the the president of that branch. Then if you're really good at your job, you move up to you know associate vice president of marketing. If you're really good at that job, you move up to vice president of marketing. If you're really good as a music educator, you get a rot there for the rest of your life. I mean, <laughs> it, it's really. I mean, it, it really doesn't matter whether you're good or bad at your job, you stay there. And mm. what I found for me was that about every seven years, I got an itch, you know, and I don't think I'm uncommon in that, but I spent seven years trying to figure out how to be a teacher, to be honest with you. And then, mm. then I decided I wanted to move in the administrative route. So I became a department chair and, and then an assistant principal. And I, I, and I did that. And then I went back to the classroom for five more years. And then I got the itch again. And then I started Scott Lang Leadership. And I spent uh, seven years doing that. And then I created Be Part of the Music, which was you know, mm -hmm. a nonprofit that uh, allowed people uh, to have access to recruitment and retention materials. And after seven years, that grew to be acquired by music and arts. And so mm -hmm. it's been an evolution for me because I think for most teachers, this is true that you know we're not built to do the same thing for 30 years. It's just that's not the mm. way our minds and our bodies operate. And so we have to understand that while we may not grow vertically, that we have to be able to grow laterally. We have to learn to, to spread our wings inside the profession and maybe be a committee chair, maybe serve our state MEA, maybe start a side business, maybe become a mentor teacher. That We're all looking for ways because it's the only way that you can keep from burning out. It's the only way that you can keep fresh. It's the only way that mm. you can continue to be energized and enthused about this profession. Because if we're just doing the same thing for 30 years, we will atrophy mentally, mm. emotionally, physically, and musically. So that was my way of keeping from atrophying is, is finding different ways to grow laterally that led me to this conversation today. I can tell you're a very energetic person. I could see that you'd, you'd need some freshness, some new things to challenge you. Is that, does that sound right? Yeah, someone someone described me just recently is like a Chihuahua puppy on Red Bull, and I, I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not, but it really kind of hit the nail on the head. I couldn't I couldn't really argue with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, so, so your your offerings for leaderships. Uh, I was looking at your website. You have some leadership camps and things. I'm just curious. What what does that look like? You know, it's it's just really spending a lot of days on the road and and walking into band rooms, choir rooms, and orchestra rooms, talking to kids about being the best version of themselves. And mm -hmm. you know, when people say, "What's your content?" And I say, "The content has been the same since you know since the beginning of time, since since the Quran, since the Bible. You know, hmm. it, it hasn't changed. It's about being the best version of yourself. What changes is the context." You know, mm. what works in a band room doesn't work in a locker room. What works in a locker room doesn't work in a classroom. What works in a sure. classroom doesn't work in a boardroom. It's about taking that content and it's about placing it in a content, a context that's meaningful and relevant for kids involved in music education. You know, mm. if I walked into a, I'm a big football fan, but if I walked into a locker room and delivered the content, it wouldn't have meaning because I don't have the context of being 6'4 and having been an offensive lineman for 10 years. Mm. If I walked into a, a boardroom, uh, the content would be valuable, but the context of not having been and run or, you know, run a Fortune 500 company wouldn't have value. So more than content. It's about context. Okay. And so that's my job is to walk around and make better people by building content that's relevant to the context of being a teenager in music. Okay. I love it. So you've been doing that for, for a number of years, it sounds like. 16. 16. Okay, great. So you've seen a lot of band rooms. You've seen a lot of music education programs around the country. Yes. Except for the last couple of years. <laughs> which have been so challenging. I can't even imagine a bigger challenge for music education than what has happened with, with COVID and, and school shutdowns and, and all of that, that ed reps have seen themselves trying to get out there, talk to their, their own customers, band and orchestra teachers. And uh, that's, that's really what I wanted to talk to you today about, the big picture of what's happened in the world of music education, how COVID has affected it, and how how it looks going forward and how ed reps can best service their customers knowing some of these, these big picture challenges they're dealing with. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen, what you've experienced and teachers you've talked to over the last couple of years about how they as people, how they as teachers have been affected over the last couple of years of COVID? Well, the impact's been immense. I mean, you know, the first thing that we, that we saw is enrollment. That's the number one impact. 
And what we saw is when COVID hit, we saw a 26% decline in enrollment in music programs across the board. Mm. And now it varied depending on what level you were, whether you were uh, asynchronous, hybrid, or in-person learning, and it depended mm-hmm. on geography. So it, 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 it's mystifying to me and probably mystifying to most of the world, given the fact that all children are biologically the same, but depending on where you live, we dealt with COVID very, very, very differently. Yes, And so, you know, it, it depended on whether you were, if, if you were <clears throat> high school based in person daily learning, the impact was about 9% drop in enrollment. If you were elementary based asynchronous or distant learning, the enrollment drop was anywhere from 36 to 100%. So Whoa. the impact varied. Yeah. I mean, some programs just shut down. It was 100%. They closed. And other programs were severely in, uh, mitigated. So the overall average loss was about 26% loss in terms of enrollment. That was the number mm. one impact thing that we saw. 26% uh, overall enrollment loss. When we look back at this year, we're still down about 18%. So it's a 10% improvement over where we were pre-pandemic in 2019, Mm -hmm. but we're still down about 18% in terms of enrollment. Now, again, if you're high school, in-person, non-impacted in in terms of distancing or social mitigation strategies, then it's it's closer to 4%, but basically 18% down. We're projecting next year to still be down to pre-pandemic levels about anywhere from, (coughs) pardon me, 4 to 6%. Now, these are projections. So we're we're trending in the right direction. But the thing to see at the end of that tunnel is that it's a donut hole. And so if you're familiar with the donut hole theory of, you know, of prescription medications, like we have this great benefit on the front end, we have a great benefit on the back end, but in the middle, we've got a big donut hole. Well, it's the same thing in music education. What we saw is the the non-starts or the delayed starts or the mitigated starts, you know, a kid who started in sixth grade, played for seven months, and then in March didn't play for 18 months. And then Mm. went back again. Or the kid that didn't start in sixth grade and is now a beginner in eighth grade. That donut hole right now is sitting in the seventh and eighth grade area. Now, depending on when you start, if you Mm. start in fourth grade, they're in seventh grade. If you start in sixth grade, they're now freshmen in high school. But the point is, there's a middle school donut hole. And that donut hole is what's showing down about 18%. The, the beauty of it is, though, is if I can stick with my, my breakfast uh, food metaphor, <laughs> is that behind that donut hole is a big old apple fritter and that we're projecting new starts next year to be up from pre-pandemic levels, that wow. we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We see that this music education is going to grow again, but that donut hole is working its way through the system. So next year, you're going to see it in the eighth grade, ninth grade, and then two years from now, it's going to be freshman, sophomore, and high school. Hmm. You know, and it, it, it's impactful in, in a way that's not just about enrollment, is what we're seeing is, is learning loss. And, you know, it's, we have to understand that we have to be able to quantify that. In order to achieve mitigation strategies, in order to understand whether we're whole again, we have to know what we lost. What we're basically Mm. seeing is that it's a 20% learning loss. So in addition to an 18% loss in enrollment, that students who stayed in music are are at about a 20% learning loss from where they should be had they not experienced the pandemic. And what we're really seeing is the least amount of time that you played, the more impactful the learning loss was. So if you look at this way, what most teachers are reporting are that my wind ensemble, yeah, it's, you know, they're pre- it's like riding a bike. It took me nine weeks. We're back where we were. My mm-hmm. freshman band, I'm teaching how to hold the instrument again. Oof. And so that learning loss of 20% overall a program wide really looks like it's about an 8% learning loss for your senior wind ensemble. It's about a 45% learning loss for your freshman group. You know, mm. that the longer they played, the less impactful the stoppage was. The shorter they played, the more impactful the stoppage was. So the donut hole is not just about enrollment. The donut hole is about learning loss for those who even stayed enrolled. And then, you know, the third impact that we saw was just frankly in teacher morale. And Mm -hmm. that's the one thing that isn't getting better. You know, when we surveyed uh, the state of music education in, in 2021, what we found is that, you know, overwhelmingly that the teachers were struggling, but they felt optimistic about the future of music education. And that while they, they were impacted and, and, and not enjoying the experience of teaching remotely or teaching asynchronously or teaching, you know, in, in, in a distant learning or socially mitigated strategy was not pleasant. They were getting through it and they, and the phrase they used was, more good days than bad. 
And that I, okay. I believe, and, and I don't have the numbers right at my feet, but I believe it, it, at one point it was something like 13%, 12 or 13% were considering a change of profession. Now, in the 2021 hmm. survey, which we completed about three and a half months ago, we saw those numbers trend in, a, in not a positive way. We saw oh. that 19% were now looking at it, it possibly changing professions. And I recently read an article in Education Wide that 53% of teachers are either considering leaving the profession or leaving it earlier than they had originally planned. Over and half. So the impact, yeah, the Ooh. impact uh, has been not only in enrollment, the impact has been in learning loss, but then the impact is going to be moving forward in teacher loss. And that's the impact that really scares me the most because to be very frank with you, yeah. um, is that that's the one that has the quickest and most devastating impact on a program. And that, you know, when someone, when, there's nothing that's a greater threat to music education than the teacher leaving the program. Mm -hmm. The greatest threat to music education comes from within music education and it's teacher loss. It's just that mm. simple. Mm. It's just that simple. So those are the three things that we're seeing really the impact of the pandemic, which was one, enrollment loss, number two, learning loss, and number three, teacher loss. And the latter is one that concerns me the most moving forward. Yeah. Wow. So over half of teachers right now are considering quitting early or, or moving on to a different profession. Education wide. That's not a music education industry wide, specific. not just music. Okay. That is correct. We don't have data and we have our data that says 19% are considering that in a music education. Okay. And the thing is, you have to look at it. it's really it's a high low when, when you think about it in that, you know, you either love this profession so much you could never leave it or you love mm -hmm. it so much you can't imagine doing it this way. You know, mm -hmm. music education is very unique in that way. You know, and I, the, the phrase I like to use is that there is no curricula that has been more impacted by COVID than music education. Then there's no curricula that's deserving of more relief than music education from COVID. You know, I don't, I mean, and I don't mean to suppose or supplant, you know, what it would be like to be an English teacher asynchronous, asynchronous or distant learning or with mitigation strategies, <clears throat> but you're going to be hard pressed to convince me that the impact was greater in an English class than it was in music education. English class, mm -hmm. you know, gosh darn, we have to do it with a mask on. In music, it's, we got to do it outside and you can't play. You know, in a math class, mm -hmm. we're going to teach you the problem via a screen. In a music class, it's we're not going to play for the next six months. You know, in a, in a mm -hmm. class that's science, it's required. So you're coming no matter what. In a music class, is, this isn't what I signed up for, so I'm out. Right. So, right. you know, it, 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 to say that it was anything short of devastating would be underselling the impact of, of what COVID did to music education. And yet, teachers and road reps soldiered on. I mean, right. uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I don't like to use the word lightly, but they're heroes. You know, when I look at, it's so funny because, you know, my next door neighbor is an incredible guy. He's a lieutenant colonel and, and, and it was a lieutenant colonel. He flew Black Hawk pilots. Oh. He was a Black Hawk pilot in the army. And, you know, he, he always talks about serving his country. And I always thank him for serving his country. My father was a Marine. I did not, I did not serve in that way, but, you know, he and I had a really meaningful conversation not that long ago. I said, you know, Jim, there's other ways to serve a country. To be a social worker is to serve mm. our country. To be a police officer, to be a first responder, to be an ER nurse is serving our country. To be a teacher is serving our country. And that anyone who has sacrificed personal gain for the betterment of a society serves our country. Mm -hmm. And I believe that teachers have served our country in a way that can only be paralleled in this time by nurses. So, you yeah. know, I, I don't, I'm not shy about using the word heroes. You know, hmm. people who went to work every day for little pay for the betterment of someone else. And so I don't true. think we should under undervalue what music education and the folks who are, uh, who are involved in it did to keep children healthy, happy, safe, and sound. Hmm. So well said. Yeah, it's so true. And ed reps are out there trying to support those who you just described. Listen, ed reps, you know, I've said, and for those who don't know, I work for music and arts now after they acquired Be Part of Music. And I, I have said more than a hundred times, ed reps are the backbone of the music education industry. Hmm. You know, it's, it truly, I mean, I don't know of a harder job getting less thanks than that job. 
I mean, when I look at my job, I'm like, I've got the easiest job in the world compared to the guy who's eating, you know, a ham sandwich got from the quick trip, living out of his minivan, logging 800 (laughs) miles a week, servicing teachers that he's got to get inside of three minutes on a schedule that that doesn't provide any relief. And they got to spend their nights doing, you know, instrument demonstration events. I mean, I don't know that it gets any more and I say this with respect, blue collar than that in music education. Hmm. Yeah. You described it well. They're out there working their tails off. Oh, it's a grind. Yeah. I mean, it's like you sit in first class on an airplane. Look at the guy who's servicing it, who's loading the baggage, who's making sure it's fueled, who's standing in the 118 degree heat, waving the the plane into the gate. That's the guy who keeps the plane going. It's not the Hmm. gate agent. You know, that that's a job that can be replaced, but the guy who fuels it, the guy who, who loads the baggage, the guy who, who makes sure that the systems are operating and the gate bridge is working and brings the, brings the aircraft in to be deplaned. That's the guy that is, is, is the hero in that formula. And I really view, you know, that the educational representatives is those people. They do the Mm. real work that keeps the industry up and running. That's that's so true. <laughs> I haven't thought of it that way, but man, you're you're so right. You're so right. Yeah, the plane's great, but if you can't get off it because you can't get a taxi to the gate, what good <laughs> right. is you know what good is going from Baltimore to L.A. if you can't get off the plane in L.A. Right. That's the bottom all line. the logistics. What, yeah, what good is is it to have a kid in a chair if you can't get a box of reeds in their hands, or mm-hmm. you can't get the instrument repaired to get it working, or you know you can't get the valve oil or the mouthpiece or the mute so that you can sex- successfully perform the you know the piece of music you're looking for? Because by the time the music teacher is done, the store is closed. They got to go home. Mm-hmm. They got to take care of their kids. They got to feed their family. So mm-hmm. you know it's it's a vital yet overlooked logistical. You know, when, when you think about L.A. Harbor and you think about the hundreds of, of cargo ships that are sitting out in the bay, you realize the tugboat captain is pretty gosh darn important at this point. Hmm. Mm hmm. Totally. Totally. I'm sure the ed reps listening right now are appreciating that someone is recognizing. Uh, no, the they've tuned out. They, the they've jobs. left the podcast already. Right now, they're watching, you know, they're watching the latest episode of Ted Lasso. So but I appreciate right. the sentiment. I really do. <laughs> so you described the challenges of, of what teachers went through and, and the numbers and all that. So speaking of ed reps, what can an ed rep do now to help support these teachers? It sounds like they're, they're mentally fried. They're, they're challenged with numbers in their programs. What are some things that an ed rep can do to help the teacher as a person and help their program? Well, it's really two things. It's facilitation and empathy. And I wouldn't put them in that order. It's empathy and Mm -hmm. facilitation. So empathy meaning, you know, uh, that being that voice of, I'm here for you. I see you. I want to help you. And I know what you're going through. It's not about what people know. You know, I I do a lot of teacher and services. It's just part of Mm -hmm. what I do. And, And they're always like, well, here's what I want you to talk about. And, and in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, teachers don't need more information. Hmm. There's no lack for information in this world. It's called YouTube. It's called Wikipedia. It's called <laughs> Google. There is nothing that I am going to say that a teacher can't find out for themselves or doesn't already know. What hmm. The value that I can bring that YouTube can't, the value proposition of, of having me spend time with you as an ed rep is how I can make you feel. Because hmm. YouTube can't do that. Wikipedia can't do that. Google can't do that. And so the very first thing I think we can do as an industry as a whole, as a profession as a whole, is provide empathy. You know, hmm. that we understand what you're going through and we know it sucks. And we just want you to know we appreciate you and we're here for you. That is the number one thing anyone in this profession can do for anyone else in this profession. Hmm. And then the second thing is facilitation. It's about providing the resources, uh, tools, and things that they need that will make their jobs easier. Not better, but easier. Hmm. You know, I I was talking to an industry person not that long ago, and they said, well, we want to provide these long-term tools for program success. And I said, gosh, that's fantastic. So while you teach a person to swing, they'll swim, they'll drown. Why didn't you just Hmm. throw them a life raft? Like, Hmm. let's worry about swimming later. 
Let's keep them alive. And that's where we're at at this point. I'm not worried about how can I facilitate your organization to achieve your concert at Carnegie Hall. What I'm worried about is, are you coming back tomorrow? Hmm. That's what I'm worried about. Are you going to be a teacher next year? Are you in a place where you, you feel good about who you are and where your program's heading? These are the things that I'm concerned about right now. And so I really believe those are the two things that, that our industry needs now more than ever, which is empathy and facilitation. How do we make teachers feel? And then what are the immediate tools that we can provide that can make their day better today, tomorrow, next week? I'll worry about next year, next year. That's, hmm. we don't know. And if anything, the pandemic's caught us is we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I mean, I thought the pandemic was over. I was back on the road and then gosh, darn, right. You know, here come, here come the Delta variant. And then gosh, we got through that. Oh, here comes Omicron. I mean, like, right. And now they're talking about Omicron too. I don't, I, I can't, I can't wrap my head around next August. I can wrap hmm. my head around today and tomorrow. That's about all you're going to get from me right now. Hmm. Sounds like we're in kind of a, a critical moment from what you're oh, describing. It, it, you know, I can't speak for others, but you know, the fact that 53% of all teachers say they're thinking about not coming back next year. I, I think that would define as critical. You know, the fact enrollment mm. took the biggest hit ever in the history of music education. I would, I would call that critical. So yeah, mm. critical, not, not, not diabolical, not, not unrecoverable, but critical. You know, and the thing is we have to understand that this is also an opportunity for us. The Chinese character for crisis is really two characters and one represents danger and one represents opportunity. And hmm. one you have control over and one you don't. You know, hmm. We don't have control over the danger. I can't make Omicron less dangerous. I can't make asynchronous learning less dangerous. I can't make aerosol studies less dangerous. What I can do is seize the opportunity associated with it. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, people who say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to do anything. Well, that's just crazy to me because the thing is, it's like the stock market, you know, it takes a drop. The, the, the novice investor sells, the professional investor sees it as an opportunity and buys, mm -hmm. you know, this is a buy opportunity for music education. It's also true. Well, because the bottom line is, and you know, I'm going to talk about this tonight at a webinar is that the bottom line is that it's a chance to reevaluate everything we do. And everyone who says, you know, gosh, I just can't wait for it to get back to normal. You've got to be freaking kidding me. <laughs> we went through two years of hell and you want to go back to what we did. Hmm. What, why then what was the gain of all this? We only felt the pain. We didn't feel the gain. We only saw the low. We didn't feel the high. We only saw the bad. We didn't find the good. You're telling me we're going to go back to 80-hour work weeks and, and <laughs> right. 180 pages of drill? We're going to go back to, to working ourselves to the, to the grindstone and focusing only on performance? We didn't learn anything from this? Hmm. It makes zero sense to me. And I would never choose to go through what we went through the past two years, but I would never choose to come out of it and go back to the way I was. You know, as a person, as a business owner, as someone involved in music education, the, the virus, the pandemic has forever transformed me, <laughs> period. And I could make an argument, it was the best two years of my life. I was home, I traveled 200 days a year. I was home for 18 months. I built mm -hmm. tree forts with my kids. Hmm. I, I bought a cabin in the woods and I'm like, and, and learned how to do hang drywall and run electrical. I didn't know how to do any of that. Right. Right. You didn't have time, right? Right. You were always running and gunning to the next performance. You were yep. always prepping for the next event. You were worried about work and not what was at home. Like I said, I'm not saying, you know, for everyone, the good outweighs the bad, but to only take the bad and not hmm. walk out with the good it's about returning to a new normal. Hmm. You know, Sounds like a better normal, right? You know, I'll leave that to, to other people to decide. For me, a better normal. Yes, hmm. there's no question. There's no question. You know, but the thing is, we have to understand that 93% of kids will never touch their horns after high school. And by the way, that number is getting better. It's getting uh, lower. That only 7% will play their instruments after high school, but 100% will be human after high school. <laughs> and what the pandemic has, I think, taught us is that 
that personal growth and that social emotional component is is more prevalent than we thought. Hmm. And in music, especially in the high school, we always involved it, whether it was leadership training or character development or talking to the kids about being better people or work ethic or passion or commitment or dedication. You know, but we never codified it and we never invested in it and we never um, measured it and we never formally embedded it into the program. Hmm. And what I saw during the pandemic was, you know, teachers saying, well, I, we can't play our horns today, so let's take a chapter from Covey. We can't, we can't be together, you know, making music, so let's talk about the history of music education. I, we can't be together to work on our scale set, so let's do music theory today. And so what I saw, you know, and, and nationwide, I, I released some curriculum and, you know, if you believe that the self-reported numbers over, it was leadership curriculum and it was, it was, it was utilized by over 600,000 kids. Whoa. Well, had the pandemic not occurred, that would have never occurred. All right. And it was a chance for directors to stop and codify, formalize and structure other elements of instruction that may not have happened due to performance constraints. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think those elements will never change, you know, and I hope, I would think that we learned instructional strategies and program management strategies that moving forward, we would keep with us. I was talking to one director and I was doing a seminar and I said, write down one thing that got better in the pandemic that you'll never, you'll never stop doing. And one director wrote, we used to take a temperature check at the doorway every single day. It was required. And he said, when that went away, we still stood at the doorway every day and said, good morning hmm. to every child. Huh. And he said, I'll never not do that again. You know, and I thought that was a really powerful example of ways in which the pandemic forced us to be better or yeah. forced us to be different, forced us to reevaluate. It's just personal. I don't mean to, to throw this on the ed reps, but an example was, I had been saying for years to my wife, I can't, I can't jockey a plane for the next 10 years. It's killing my body. 200 days. Hmm. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. wake up 5 a.m. I'm on a plane by seven. I fly for three hours. I speak. I drive to the airport. I get on a plane again. I mean, it's, it's nonstop. But the pandemic forced me to figure out a different way to live. It, it, yeah. it, was, it wasn't, well, I, I'll figure it out eventually. It was, no, you're going to figure it out now. No choice. You know? And so it was very good for me in terms of forcing me to confront, deal with, face, and address things that I had been talking about for years. So to the band directors, like, the grind is killing me. I'm gone every Friday night. I'm working 90 hours a week. And they, they would have continued on that same self, self-destructive pathway, mm -hmm. maybe in mm -hmm. perpetuity, until the pandemic said, you're not going to work 90 hours a week. You're not even going to work 30. Now, what are you going to do? And so, you know, I think in some ways, certainly I don't want to minimize the tragedy of the pandemic or the impact, uh, personal, emotional, programmatic, musical. But what I have tried to do is say, well, I can't control the bad, but I can control the good. I can't control the pain, but I can control the gain. And so hmm. I've tried to focus on the gain. Hmm. You know, I think sometimes we forget that the the burnout rate of music teachers pre pandemic was was really quite high. Just like you're describing, it was fifty seven percent are out by year five. Oh, it's terrible. Yes, yeah, do you think that's going to improve? Sixteen percent never teach. Thirty three percent leave before year five, and fifty six percent leave by year five or six. Gosh, that's awful. Yep. Do you think going forward that that will improve? I guess no. maybe once we get over this, it's no. think it'll always be I that do. way. Yeah, I don't. You know, mm. I, and I, I look. I could, I could, I could spray sunshine all day at you. But teaching music and education in general is moving in a very bad direction. It's become politicized. You know, there's I think 13 states right now that have bills that say teachers have to post their curricula online two weeks in advance, and a parent can opt out of anything that they want. What? Oh yeah. There's, uh, there's several states and school districts that are saying that we have to prevent, we have to present a balanced view of the Holocaust. Whoa. I don't know what that is, 
But I don't know how we balance the Holocaust. The thing is, teaching music and education is a young man's game, a young person's game. And as much as I wish that weren't true, if you're asking me, do I see that changing? No, I do not. Hmm. Now, that doesn't mean people won't make it their life's work. And you know, we talked about that lateral profession. I'm not saying, you know, a lot of the people listening right now were once teachers. They didn't mm -hmm. leave music education. They left the classroom. That maybe you become an administrator, a department chair. Maybe you become a road rep. Maybe you become a composer. Maybe you write drill. Maybe you become a consultant. Maybe you come. I have always said leader, uh, music education will always be my life's work, but it will, it will just won't be in a class. Hmm. You know, think about this. You know, if you're an ed, ed rep, can you, can you name any other profession that accounts for 54 minutes of every hour? I mean, I look at my CEO and I'm like, you don't work 54 minutes out of every hour. I look at my vice <laughs> president above me. I say, you don't work 54 minutes out of every hour. And maybe you work 61 hour, but you're off 25 the next. Teaching music. And it's not even like teaching English. And I, I don't mean to, you know, to, to disparage another, you know, curricula, but they can say, read this chapter while I take attendance. Hmm. Right. Watch this video. Teaching music. 54 minutes of every hour are accounted for. And by the way, you got to close up one class, greet the next class, prep your scores, and maybe, maybe have a second to, to visit the bathroom in six minutes. Wow. Like that is a young man's, young woman's game. That is a mm. grind that is unlike any other profession I'm aware of. And, mm. and again, I don't know what I don't know. And I'm not equating standing on a podium, conducting Mahler to running into a burning building. But I know of no other profession that accounts for time in the way that music education does. Whenever the teacher is running for the parking lot, we're running for the parking lot to rehearse. Whenever the teacher wants smaller class sizes, we want larger class sizes. Whenever the teacher wants more prep time, we want more student time. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's a grind that is unlike any other profession I've ever witnessed. Hmm. I think this is bringing into focus the, the real importance of a very supportive ed rep to these, these teachers. There's no question. I hmm. mean, it's a lifeline, you know, and it's, it's so funny because my ed rep, my ed rep, when I started uh, teaching in 1991, is now my colleague at Music and Arts. He's the same hmm. guy. And we wow. still joke about, he saved me. We were performing with the Canadian Brass at NAFME and he got me a new Barry Sachs because my Barry Sachs broke just before the concert. Oh. I, we joked about it the other day. I, I'm not sure I ever paid that repair bill, but you know, <laughs> uh, you know, if it weren't for people like him, like if it weren't for instrument, the, here's the thing. And I don't think it's an industry secret that says the only thing that keeps music education alive are method book sales and instrument rentals. That's huh. it. If it weren't for those two things, music education would die because no company could survive. Hmm. Hal Leonard isn't making money on, on, on Richard Saucedo's latest work that they sold 52 copies of. What keeps Hal Leonard afloat, and I can't speak for John Malinzik, is essential elements. Hmm. What keeps music stores afloat are instrument rentals. It's, it's not the box of reeds they sold. You know, and instrument rentals don't happen without ed reps, period, the end. I mean, right. Right. our entire industry stands on the shoulders of ed reps, period, the end. You know, mm. the, 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 the reference I make, and my friend says it's, it's pejorative, and I don't think it is, but I'm going to share with you, it's not my intent to be pejorative. It's they're the honeybees. Einstein was credited as saying, he didn't say it, but he did agree with the concept, but he didn't actually say it. But he's credited with saying that without the honeybee, all life on this planet would end within 14 years. Huh. Because without the honeybee, you don't have pollination. Without pollination, you don't have flowers. Without flowers, you don't have fruit. Without fruit, you don't have food. Without food, you don't have carnivores. And it, it trickles on up. Right, right. Without the ed rep, you don't have fifth grade instrument rentals. Without instrument rentals, you don't have fifth grade beginning band. Without fifth grade beginning band, you don't have sixth grade beginning band next year. And then you have two years. Within 14 years, music education's over. It's done. Mm -hmm. It's that right. simple. Right. You know, and the well, without the, the ed rep, the teachers would have to do everything that the ed reps do themselves, and they have no time to do it. And they would leave. They would leave the profession. Right. Even more if people you told would leave. me, I had to... 
to run instrument inventory, instrument acquisition, instrument maintenance on on all my instruments, I, I'm I'm done. I, I I'm mm. done. I can't. I don't know what more. It's so funny. I used to joke with my 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 administrator. I go, you know, we have an equipment tra- an equipment manager for all of our athletic gear, I and mean, that's their job manage the helmets, manage the jerseys, man, wash the uniforms. I go, I have more equipment and more uniforms than the athletic department. And I do it myself on top of teaching full-time. Hmm. I don't understand that. Like, I, I don't understand why you have a full-time person to manage 52 football helmets. And I have 284 instruments. I have 84 music stands. I have 72 chairs. I have, uh, you know, 164 uniforms. I have you know, I don't understand that. You get and, and by the way the value of of a football a football fully clothed helmet, shoulder pads, pads, gear, the whole nine yards is $352. An instrument is 7000. Right. A band a marching band uniform is 375. Like hmm. it it doesn't make sense to me. So if you want to add on top of that, I have to manage my rental, you know, finances, inventory, method books, it's a bridge too far. Right. There's no way they could do it. So that brings us back to kind of the, the question from earlier is what are some of the important things that ed reps can do right now? Because it does sound like it's a, a critical time. What can they do right now to help these teachers, I guess, make sure they stay, make sure they stay in the profession and, and help, I guess, save some teachers from wanting to go on. I mean, no one can blame them for the the feelings of wanting to leave right now after the challenges of the last two years, what can an ed rep do right now to help them feel better about their life and their, their, their profession and stay? Well, there's a couple of things. Again, I'm, I'm going to revert back to empathy. That's, that's first and foremost, you know, as, uh, and I know they have a hundred teachers are visiting, you know, but uh, how are you doing a high five? Uh, you're killing it, dude. A cup of coffee will mm-hmm. go a long way. So that's, that's number one. The second thing is any done for you solutions, you know, Hey, by the way, here's, I filled out this requisition for you. Hey, I, here's an invoice. I know you needed that oboe repaired. I've already done the invoice for you. Hey, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and grab those two trumpets that aren't working. I know you've been meaning to get to done for you solutions, you know, Hmm. Hey, here's, here's an RFP. I, I did it. I know you're wanting to do a new drum line in the future. I went ahead and looked at it for you. Hey, there was a box of reeds that was going to get thrown away here. I, I thought I'd give it to you. Hey, you know, th- done for you. Where it, hmm. it doesn't add to the teacher's workload. It reduces the teacher's workload. And then three, anything you can do to help grow enrollment. You know, there's nothing. Hmm. You know, enrollment is the panacea to all problems in music education. It, it's just that simple. You, you can't find a problem that enrollment doesn't make better. You want a bigger budget, get more kids. You want better facilities, get more kids. You want more parents involved, get more kids. You want better clarinets, get more clarinets. There is no problem in music education that isn't solved by enrollment. And hmm. for the life of me, it confounds me why every, every person associated with music education isn't jumping up and down screaming enrollment, 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 enrollment. Hmm. The, the greatest lesson ever taught to an empty chair doesn't mean anything. It's right. worthless. It truly is value, void of value. I don't understand why we're talking about anything other than enrollment. So anything an ed rep can do to help teachers grow their enrollment, whether it's using our resources to be part of the music or, or helping that teacher develop their own resources, but anything you can do to help a teacher grow their program is going to grow their, their self-esteem and it's going to grow their morale. So those are the three things, empathy, done for you solutions and enrollment and program growth. Those are the three things that will have the greatest impact on not just an educator, but in music education in general, period. Hmm. Those are excellent. So it sounds like if an ed rep is very proactive and thinks about the needs of a teacher, even before maybe even the teacher thinks of them and presents them as you're going to need this, here's the solution. And yeah. they get out there and help recruit. Yeah. You got to be a lot of ed reps do. Yeah. yeah you you got to be a mind reader. And what, what Sally wants is not what Beth wants. And what Beth wants isn't what Jimmy wants. And what Jimmy wants isn't what Osrob wants. You know, mm. that's the thing is it's, I, I'm not saying it's easy, but those are the three things that will cross pretty much every line, which is, you know, remind them that they matter and they're making a difference wherever you can fill a pothole. Mm. You know, I don't need you to repave the street. I need you to fill a pothole. 
And and the third thing is, you know, tips, tricks, solutions, and we have a ton of them at bepartofthemusic.org, you know, that that can help teachers grow their programs. Because when we see numbers go up, teachers see the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're if you watched your income go down in year one, you'd be alarmed. If you watched your income go down in year two, you'd be really alarmed. If you watched your mm-hmm. income go down in year three, you'd start looking for a new job. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what enrollment is to a teacher. You know, a teacher mm-hmm. doesn't look at their paycheck. There's no bonus structure. There's right. no, I'm getting a raise based on merit. It doesn't exist in education. What they view, their, their, their worth, their self-esteem, their value proposition is enrollment. When they see their program growing, they feel valuable. They feel successful. They feel like they're doing good at their job. When they see enrollment go down, it is soul crushing. And I can tell you Mm. without question, every year, the worst day of the year was the day I got numbers. I mean, I went in that day knowing this is dark. Because no matter how good my numbers are, I'm going to find five kids that are going to break my soul. How did I fail? I didn't them? sign what up. Mm. What do you mean they're quitting? I thought they loved band. I thought they liked me. What did I do? Mm. I, I could be up 40 kids next year compared to this year, but I'll find the 10 that didn't sign up and it will break me for two days. Oh. It's powerful, huh? It is. And I, mm. I know and, and if, any, if anyone, and I know there are a ton of ed reps on here that were teachers, they know what I'm talking about. I've mm. never met a teacher that, that it didn't break them. And that they didn't focus on the five who didn't sign up over the 50 that did sign up. I don't know a single teacher I've ever met that can't share that same story. Hmm. I know a lot of ed reps out there who help recruit with their band and orchestra teachers. Can you, can you share some ideas or maybe some, some stories from your, your life as a, a teacher that ed reps can be more a part of recruiting or some ideas on some successful recruiting for, for teachers right now? It's March in, in, in 2022. So I imagine right now, a lot of people are, are out there trying to recruit the next batch of beginners or, or trying to get students to sign up for next year. Do you have any tips for everybody listening? Well, there's a couple of things. I think, you know, not just ed reps, but anyone involved in recruiting, you got to, th- it's marketing, you know? And hmm. so we've got to stop thinking like music educators and we got to start thinking like target. Hmm. You know, and to, to, to be fair and to be clear, very few purchases are what I would call impulse purchases, meaning I walk into Target and I'm looking for a pack of gum, but I buy, I buy a cardigan sweater instead. <laughs> you know, very few purchases are done that way for me, you know, and so I go to the, I go to Target looking for a pack of gum and I buy a pack of gum. You don't decide to join band in April. You've already decided. It's done. The Hmm. decision's already been made. The parent has decided in their mind. They just haven't filled out the paperwork yet. They haven't filled out the paperwork to run an instrument or they haven't filled out the paperwork to not run an instrument. But, you know, too often we think of of recruiting as if it were a one-off event when it's not. Hmm. And we have to understand that, that recruiting is happening right now. It's happening. The decision's being made right now. It'll manifest itself in April, but you don't think every parent hasn't thought, okay, I know what my kid's taking next year. Hmm. I've, I'm a parent. I, my, I know exactly what my boys are taking next year. I've already made the decision. We haven't filled out the school paperwork yet, but I've made that decision. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the two things I think are important is number one, we've got to be marketing well in advance of the event, well in advance. Hmm. You know, it's what we do prior to the purchase point, you know, and that's what Target does through Facebook ads and blog posts and email blasts and advertising on TV and radio ads and product placement in movies, what they're doing is triggering the decision prior to the point of purchase. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we need to be looking at music education. How are we triggering that decision prior to the point of execution? You know, that people wander into instrument demo night on the fence. I don't know if we're going to come home with an instrument tonight. Strikes me as being a little bit naive and short-sighted. Hmm. Hmm. They, they decided they're at their instrument demonstration event. They've made the decision. They're there. Right. You know, and you can, uh, it's like buying a car. I'm not wandering onto a car lot wondering if I'm going to buy a car. 
I wander into a car lot wondering which car am I going to buy and who am I buying it from? Hmm. So I wander in, into an instrument demo wondering which instrument and am, am I going to play and which brand am I going to acquire? But I've made the decision to do music. I came to the event. You know, you don't go to a car lot and go, hey, do you have any Wonder Bread? <laughs> no, you came to a car lot. Why? Because you want to buy a car. And we have to also understand that, you know, it's so funny to me because people are like, oh, I got to, I got to get that kid. I get it. That kid's, I got to get that kid. He's amazing. I mean, he's an all-state oboist. I'm like, well, yeah. You think he's in danger of quitting? He's an all-state oboist. He loves band. He's got three hmm. private lesson teachers. He ain't the kid you got to worry about. It's the kid that didn't come tonight. It's the hmm. kid that's on the fence. What are you doing to recruit that kid? It's, you've got to recruit in the margins. That's where, that's where hmm. programs are made or broken. The margins. Where do we the find kids the kids the that are on the fence? Hmm. And that's probably, you know, by and large, 20% of your program. That's a lot. Oh, it's huge. You know, if you think about it, I used to tell my, my band kids, my goal every year is to get 10 new kids who never played an instrument before. Hmm. You know, so if, if I had a, a band program of 200 kids, like, just find me 10 friends, hang your honors. Maybe they're in orchestra. Maybe they're in choir. Maybe they're not anything. Find me 10 hanger honors. But over a four-year cycle, that's 40 kids. That's, a, that's an entire additional ensemble. Right. It's true. Hmm. You know, years ago, I read a, a marketing book, and it, it was talking about how many impressions someone would need to, to really have your brand at top of mind, where, where they know it, they see it. Yeah, it's way higher now, right? It's be because of the the noise of, of social media and and all the various ways of seeing things in brands. So, you know, we, we think about recruiting, we think about the petting zoos and the concerts and things like that. What are some ideas that that teachers and maybe ed reps can do to create more impressions to help people decide before that night that they want to do music? Well, you know, we we as an industry are horrifically bad at this. I mean, I don't know that we could be any worse at this. You know, everybody's in their own fiefdom. If, if you think about it, like everybody, and, and I get it, don't get me wrong, it's, it's real easy for me to spout solutions, but got milk works. You know why? It doesn't say got lucerne milk, got American <laughs> dairy farmers milk, got American standard milk. It just says, get some freaking milk, <laughs> right? Get music. You know, even inside an own school, the choir and the orchestra recruit very differently and they recruit oh, differently yeah. than the band and mm -hmm. the band it recruits differently than the middle school and the middle, like I, for the life of me, don't understand that, that strategy. I, it just doesn't make sense in my mind that we sh every school we go to, you know, you have kids, you have kids, right? Yes. You have a nine year old, one. nine year old boy, yep. correct? Yeah, correct. You know, do you know what Red Ribbon Week is? No. You don't know what Red Ribbon Week is? No. No, what wow. is it? It's Drug and Alcohol Awareness Week. Oh. It's, it's I nationwide. I should probably know that one. Yeah, okay. it's nationwide. Anytime you drive by school and you see ribbons on the fence, it's Drug and Alcohol Week. It's just okay. that simple. You know, and we need that same holistic, unified approach to music. Hmm. Got music. Now, I'm going to be really selfish here because it's self-serving. Be part of the music. Doesn't say yeah. be part of band, be part of choir, be part of orchestra, be part of middle school, be part of chamber group, be part of jazz ensemble. No, just be part of the music. I don't care where you go. Just get in music. A rising boat, a rising tide lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand why we as an industry, you know, aren't willing to work together. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to pick sides or point to, and, and again, please, is, is the person who runs Be Part of the Music, it's self-serving. I, I want to acknowledge that. But like, I don't understand why we can't get competitors to agree on this one thing, that we need to grow enrollment from the bottom up. And that, you know, yes, by joining with your competitor, by working with someone who's in the same field, you know, it, you're celebrating a competitor, but but also understand that if you own 14% of the market share and you grow the market, you win. Mm -hmm. You win. It's the rising and tide, right? 
Yeah. And I, I just, I, I don't, I don't understand the, uh, the the approach and i will say you know and i gotta give uh, i'm sure you have some some uh, reps on your podcast from music and arts and, and i know you have some reps on here obviously don't work for music and arts and one of the things music and arts has done is committed to making be part of the music free to anyone who wants to use it mm-hmm. even if it's our competitor that's great because we know that that if we grow music education that everyone benefits and by helping other music stores we're helping kids and that's mm-hmm. what we're in it for. Right. And, and society. if you do the right thing, you know, and I have tremendous respect for all of the folks who do that, whether it's Quinlan and Favish or it's Amro Music in Memphis or it's Schmidt Music up in Pennsylvania or West Music with Robin West or, you know, any, any of the, the folks who are helping fill the world with music, I wish them nothing but success. Hmm. Nothing but success. Hmm. Good stuff, Scott. I can tell you're a motivational speaker out there. And um, speaking of which, in what, two weeks, three weeks, a lot of us listening will be in Tucson, at NASMD. Yes. And, and I recommend you're, the go- Mex- you're going to be there. Yeah. I told <laughs> Mexican. Let's be really clear about this. If you go to Tucson and get a steak, you are missing the boat, folks. Hmm. Like, hmm. If you're going to Tucson, you got to get yourself some good old fashioned Mexican. And I don't mean commercial Mexican. You got to find a hole in the wall dive place in a strip mall <laughs> and ask the waiter who barely speaks English and say, what do you recommend? What do you get? And then ask the question, can I get it spicy? That's, that's the, all you need to know for NASMD right there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if you attend the conference, that's added bonus points, whatever. But get yourself <laughs> some good old hole-in-the-wall Mexican food because Tucson has really good Mexican food. Okay, that's uh, I hadn't thought of that. You're- and you're not going to get it at the JW Marriott. Let me be clear about that. This is going to require an Uber ride. And if you need a <laughs> companion, hit me up. We'll go get Mexican food together. All right, you, you're on. You, you probably know a place, right? I do, as a matter of fact. I do. And it's worth the Uber ride. <laughs> uh, hey, what day is your session? NASMD? I have a Thursday session at two o'clock on recruitment and retention. And I have a three o'clock session on the state of music education. So a lot okay. of the numbers and stats I threw at you, we're going to expound upon and share with everyone, ed reps, you know, CEOs, CFOs, and board members and officers, publishers, you know, everyone, we're going to share with them what the numbers look like for music education mm. so that they can better prepare for what's coming their way. Yeah. Well, I look forward to both of those sessions. I'll be there. And well, I'll take you up on that Mexican food. Yeah. It, you'll be the only one there. You and you and my, my golden retriever who won't leave my side. Uh, she's better looking than me for sure. And, and friendlier. So you like her. Oh, you have, you have such a powerful message, Scott. And, and I'm so glad that you shared it. And uh, what do you think the future looks like in the next couple of years with music education and teachers and programs? I think that depends on the decisions we make in the next couple of years. Hmm. I think that if we can... Uh, if we can find our voice and speak as one, the future could be extraordinarily bright. You know, we're seeing numbers are up for next year. We are seeing it. Now we have the donut hole. So overall numbers will be down again from pre-pandemic, but the, the tidal wave of, of numbers is coming. You know, I said to my wife in 2008, I said, God, what a great time to own a restaurant. She's like, what are you crazy? They're all going out of business. I said, that's exactly the point. Because hmm. what we pull out of this, if you can stay in business, you're going to have one third the competition and the same number of hungry people. Right. You know, pottery is gone. Yearbook is gone. Drama's down 32%. Dance is mm. down 18%. You know, but there's still the same number of kids in high school. We right. didn't change the number of kids. They just stopped doing things. And if we can go get those kids, and if we can demonstrate the value proposition that music brings to a child's life, to a parent and to a child, then music could experience a renaissance. And if we don't, then it won't. It's our choice. If we think we can sit here and just return to normal and get previous results, I don't believe that's the case. Hmm. You know, what, what the pandemic did 
is showed us what we could live without. That, that's the bottom line that's for true. me. Yeah. It showed me I could live without pants, right? I mean, <laughs> it, it showed me that I could live without going to the office. It showed me that I didn't need to go out to, to eat. It showed me, you know, that I didn't need to be in front of a computer for 10 hours to get my work done. It showed me what I could live without. Hmm. But, you know, it also showed me what I couldn't live without. And so I think it's important that we demonstrate that music is something that you can't live without. Because if you think about this, like I'm banned, I love band, band is my life, band is incredible, band, yay, band. And then you didn't have it for 18 months. You went, ah, you know what? I survived. Turns out I didn't need band. Turns <laughs> out I, I, or I did. I was so sad. I was so lonely. I was so isolated. I, it, it now proved to me more than ever why band matters to me or why choir matters or why orchestra matters to me. You know, but to that that group of kids that said, eh, I was on the fence, I was on the margins, and I did just fine. I didn't have to rehearse 20 hours a week, and I was still just fine. You know, that's where we've got to, to demonstrate the value to those kids and those parents of why music matters. And what I heard from directors all across the country is it thinned the herd. And that my numbers were smaller, but my kids were more rabid. Because if you were on the fence, you didn't come back. And so now we need to grow the herd. And that's not something that's going to happen without some time and effort. Mm, yeah. And a lot of support from MedReps out there. Oh, it, it's like I said, they're the honeybees. It's if without them, all music education ends in 13 years, period. <laughs> it's over. And you can make an argument that Without, without 13 years of, of music education, you lose college music programs. Without college music programs, you lose professional symphonies. Without prof I mean, it, the trickle-down effect is immense. And it's important to understand. And you know, I view ed reps you know, the same way I view elementary educators, which is you know, sometimes the most important moments happen with the worst sounds. Now huh. think about that. Because we associate the quality of the teaching with the quality of the sound. We associate the quality of the experience with the quality of the ensemble. And sure. that's just not true. That the mm. most important thing that will ever happen, and I have a video of my son playing the trombone and looking at me going, this is the instrument, dad. It didn't sound good, but it was the most important moment in his evolution of his educational pathway. Because you think about it, and I don't mean to go on, but you know that kid will go on, he's in band, and he had a good band experience, so he goes on to middle school, and he finally has a tribe, and he doesn't get bullied, and, and he thinks band is fun, so he joins a high school marching band. Now, the marching, mar marching band turns into a whole new world, and he decides he wants to be a leader, so he applies to be a section leader his sophomore year, and he becomes a section leader in his junior year, he decides to be a drum major, and his drum major, he thinks it's so great, he decides to be a music educator, and he goes on to be a music educator, and that all happened because someone put a trombone in his hand at an instrument demo night. <laughs> Think about it. His, so you know, true. The person I married was a result of the fact I was a music teacher. Had I not been a music huh. teacher, she was a family consumer sciences teacher. The children I have, the home I live in, the memories locked away in my brain and the pictures on my wall are because in the sixth grade, Larry Conrad handed me a pair of drumsticks. <laughs> I think a lot of people listening can identify with exactly what you just said. They're, they're thinking through their own life right now and thinking, yeah, I remember when I tried that cornet first and now here I am. I'd be a telemarketer in a call center, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, as a hermit with, you know, 17 cats and, you know, an iguana named Pete, you know, <laughs> literally. I mean, it is responsible for every facet of my life. Hmm. So important. Scott, if somebody wanted to learn more about what you do, your services, your leadership camps, be part of the music, or want to get a hold of you, what do you recommend? Well, first of all, go to bepartofthemusic.org uh, because those resources are built for ed reps. And every day in our work, we are talking to the ed reps at Music and Arts and saying, are you using this tool? Are you using this tool? Are you demonstrating this tool? Here's pre-written emails. Give them to your teachers. Here's pre-written content. Give them to your teachers. Here's pre-written memes and JPEGs and social media posts. So bepartofthemusic.org is where you want to start first and foremost. Okay. And you can do a deep dive there and spend hours. If you want to find me personally, you can find me at scottlang.net or you can find me at scott.lang at musicarts.com. 
I am the advocacy director for music and arts. So my job is to come up with programs to get more kids involved in music, regardless of where they rent an instrument or where they reside. And I'm happy okay. to help anyone meet that end goal, regardless who they work for and where they reside. So you can also reach out to me via my cell at 480-577-5264. Do not, under any circumstances, Google my name because you will come up with 749,000 pages of Ant-Man. And I'm not kidding. That's the actual number. I used to be I admit, number one I've done Google it. Search. You're right. I used to be number one in the Google search for Scott Lang until they came out with Ant-Man. Now, yeah, no. Oh, I'm not man. There. Hollywood messed it up. It wrecked me. Wrecked me. <laughs> so do you do speakings at MEA shows and things like that in front of All teachers? the time. All the time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I a just, teacher. I just got back from KMEA, Kentucky. I did TMEA, Texas. I did Oklahoma Music Educators. I did the Tennessee. That's all in the last five weeks. And I'm going out wow. Monday to do a county in service in North Carolina. Yeah, that's I. I do awesome. a lot of that. Awesome. And if a ed rep wanted to recommend you to say the head of their state's MEA, would they go to scottlang.net to kind of get Yeah, they go to scottlang.net. And I would like to encourage you know all my friends and colleagues in Hawaii to uh, submit my, that would be great. <laughs> uh, you know, if you live in Alaska, forget I ever existed. But yeah, because, you know, all conventions occur from January to April. And so- right, Including Alaska, which is in January. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. you know, if you happen to be, you know, in the Aloha state and would like to drop my name, I think that would be fantastic and fully. Fantastic. We can't thank you enough, Scott. This is awesome. And for everybody going to any SMD, make sure you go to Scott's sessions. I think they're going to be just as powerful as this episode and don't miss kind of event. And Mexican food. Let's not and forget that. Yes. That's the takeaway from NASMD is did you get good Mexican food? Okay. Okay. I know what I'm doing Friday night. There you go. Thanks, Scott. You're welcome. It's been my pleasure. Thanks to everyone out there who does the real work of music education. You're the true heroes. You're the true foot soldiers. And I appreciate each and every one of you. We hope you found the information in this episode useful and something you can use in your everyday life as an ed rep. If there is a topic you'd like to learn more about and have presented on a future episode of Ed Rep Radio, or do you'd like to give us some feedback in general? please email us at edrepradio at eastmanstrings.com. To learn more about Eastman Music Company, go to our website, eastmanmusiccompany.com, or give your Eastman rep a call. Thanks, and drive safe.